Hello, and welcome to this month's Rights in Russia interview. Today is February 22nd, 2024, and our guest today is Tanya Lokshina, Associate Director for Human Rights Watch's Europe and Central Asia Division. Formerly based in Moscow, she left Russia in the spring of 2022, following on the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. A journalist by training, Tanya's early work in Russia was with the Moscow Helsinki Group and the human rights think tank, Demos. She joined Human Rights Watch in 2008 and has since authored numerous major reports on human rights in Russia, including on abuses in the North Caucasus, the 2008 armed conflict in Georgia, the ongoing crackdown on critics of the government, the situation in Belarus, and violations of international humanitarian law during the armed conflicts in eastern Ukraine and Nagorno-Karabakh. In 2006, Lokshina was given the Andrei Sakharov Award, Journalism as an Act of Conscience. I first met Tanya in 2009 when I was in Russia with the MacArthur Foundation, and since that time have watched her take on some of the most pressing and dangerous human rights issues. Welcome to Rights in Russia, Tanya. Thank you. You, you began your career as a journalist. How, how did you come to focus on human rights abuses? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, I never planned to. It happened by accident, if I may put it this way. So I used to write about film and theater mm -hmm. and culture and, you know, all the good things in life. And I actually felt very passionate about it. And then uh, Russia was hit with this horrendous financial crisis in 1998 and so many media workers were made redundant or were not getting paid and ironically it just so happened that at around that time i had only just arrived to moscow from the united states to start a very fascinating job at a rather prominent publishing house, doing what I really liked. And I found myself in Moscow, which was completely shaking by the financial crisis. And my job, of course, did not work out because like I said, you know, everyone was being laid off and you could not find a job for love of money, at least in the media business. It was completely horrendous. And I was sort of stuck not sure what to do and for a couple of months i gave private lessons of uh, english and french to those families who fortunately had not lost everything in that tremendous financial crisis but that was you know not something that i wanted to do for a long time and then a friend heard from a friend heard from someone else that the moscow helsinki group which is one of the most prominent and the oldest human rights organization in the country, was urgently looking to hire someone who was fluent in English, but also knew a thing or two about human rights as they were launching a major project which involved some cooperation with international partners and frankly, not a single person on staff spoke. English, like no English at all. And well, I mean, English I spoke. As far as human rights went, I really didn't know anything much, except that when I was still in graduate school in the United States, in the city of Boston, I used to work part time for the local branch of the Andre Sakharov archives. And so I knew quite a bit about Soviet descent, all the key names and biographies and dates and whatnot. And I came in for an interview and Miss Alexeva, who ironically called herself the grandma of Russian human rights movement, uh, possibly one of the most prominent figures 
of the Soviet descent and of the Russian human rights movement. She interviewed me personally, and I think you know she got sort of duped by my knowledge of certain names and numbers pertaining to Soviet descent and automatically assumed that someone that knowledgeable should actually know a thing or two about human rights. Again, was not the case. But uh, for the first year or so, I did not quite enjoy the job um, and was rather looking forward to getting back to journalism proper because I did lots of translation work and organized all sorts of workshops and meetings and whatnot. Never felt passionate about it. And then uh, with uh, the war in the Balkans, Ms. Alexeva had this idea that as Russian media at the time, and mind you, Russia actually had independent media at the time, including independent broadcasters, sort of, you know, difficult to even imagine it now, but we are talking like 1999, uh, Russian media, including independent media, in context of that war, was full of pro-Serbian propaganda. And she had this idea, which was pretty ingenious, to raise some money and take several high-profile journalists, mostly broadcasters, to Kosovo as opposed to Serbia, so that they could, well, you know, see the other side of the story. And she, uh, she did raise the money, and she basically told me to travel with them as a fixer translator. And, you know, when I'm thinking back to it right now, would I send a very young staffer like a rookie without any experience in war zones without any um, hostile environment training to a place like Kosovo in 1999, well, I mean, no, obviously, but uh, times were different and standards were different or did not exist. And off I went to Kosovo with uh, a group of five journalists and my only skills relevant to that particular trip was being fluent in English and being fluent in French. That was the extent of my expertise. And I had to organize things like fixers, translators usually do. And one of the mm, things that I organized for my very high profile media group was a trip to Kosovska Mitrovica, which is a town in Kosovo, which was populated by both Serbians and Albanians. And because of the massacre, it eventually got split up into two parts by K4, by the international contingent, by international peacekeepers. And the way they did it is that all the Serbian population was kind of pushed to the north and all the Albanian to the south. And uh, this was a matter of convenience because the uh, town of Kosovska Mitrovica was also split up by a river called Ibor. So the river became this uh, natural divide. And uh, I made arrangements with um, the K4 to, for our group to travel from one part of the town to another part of the town. And I actually remember it very vividly. Uh, I was standing on a bridge which connected the two banks of the river with a French colonel. Mm -hmm was very charming and kind of looking onto the river and it was very cold and very foggy and I couldn't see anything much and suddenly I guess the fog just lifted a tiny bit and I realized that what I was staring at wasn't just emptiness but rather a teeny island with remnants like ruins or what used to be a village. And it was 
pretty much raised to the ground and I turned to my charming companion and I said, Mon Colonel, uh, sir, what was this village who lived there? And he was smoking a cigarette, you know, making smoke circles fly into the air and kind of, you know, being very, I mean, coquettish, I would say. And I was like, oh, darling, you know, it was just a gypsy village, a Roman village. And I said, Mon Colonel, a Roma village, a gypsy village, you call it, but who destroyed it then? Was it one side or the other side, the Serbs, the Albanians, and why? And he just looked at me, taking another puff of his cigar, and, go, and he went like, you know, darling, in this country, no one particularly likes the gypsies. So either one side first and then the other side, or, you know, the both of them, in a sense, it just got destroyed. And that's how I got hooked. Uh, literally, just this very idea that people could do those horrendous things to civilians, horrendous to the point when it's hard to digest, to understand, to make any sense of it whatsoever. And I wanted to understand why it's happening. And I wanted to understand how that could possibly be changed. And I guess, you know, from then on for the rest of my life, I still trying to find answers to those questions. How do people attack, kill, and torture other human beings and actually at times believe that it's the right thing to do? I just don't give it another thought. I haven't yet answered that question for myself. <laughs> that's a wonderful. That's a wonderful answer. You <clears throat> you mentioned your association with Ludmila Alexeva, and you worked for many years at the Moscow Helsinki Group. Um, how do, how do you explain the authorities' decision to close down this venerable organization in 2022? What was the main was the main reason the regime's plan for war, or was it an attempt to return to the Soviet Union, or maybe something else? Well, the Moscow Helsinki Group was certainly not the only high-profile human rights organization shut down by the Russian government in recent years. The crackdown on civil society has been ongoing as of 2012, when Mr. Putin returned to the Kremlin after Mr. Medvedev's four-year interregnum. Well, not that Mr. Putin had ever gone anywhere far from the Kremlin, but, you know, that's another story. Uh, as of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the situation, as far as human rights go, have become completely apocalyptic. This is a different era. This is a different country. But the crackdown mm -hmm. as such has been underway for more than a decade and just building up and building up and then reaching this horrific crescendo in early spring 2022. The government is effectively attempting, attempting to eviscerate all forms of dissent. And it's not even sufficient anymore to sit quietly minding your own business. People are being pressured to vocally support the war, the so-called special military operation in Ukraine, and to vocally support the government. 
getting rid of leading human rights organizations like Memorial, like the Moscow Helsinki Group, was a very important step in that campaign by the government to eliminate critics and authoritative critics in particular, and also to make the country so closed that little information would be available to the outside world about what's happening in there. Because while, while Russia is fighting a full-scale abusive war in Ukraine, the Kremlin is also fighting another war inside Russia against Russian civil society. And from that perspective, I would want to emphasize that, yes, they've been talking about the closure of Memorial. They've been talking about the closure of the Moscow Helsinki group. However, some activists from Memorial, from Moscow Helsinki Group, from other Russian human rights organizations, they remain on the ground at great personal risk and they continue to do their job. And they need our support. They need our solidarity like never before, or rather like Soviet dissenters needed the support and solidarity of democratic countries in their own time. This parallel is really very clear. As concerns Human Rights Watch, um, I've been working for the organization for 16 years and 14 of them from Moscow, including running the organization's Russia Bureau. And after three decades, of operating in Russia and never having any legal issues with the authorities. They were shut down in one day. It happened on the 8th of April, not surprisingly, 2022. Us and 14 other international organizations who had registered offices in Russia. So, in a sense, we were not even shut down for something very specific, which we did. We were shut down as part of this symbolic gesture by the government, as in, we don't need any internationals on the ground. We do not need. We do not want, and we are not going to tolerate any international scrutiny. At the same time, when it happened, and I was physically present in Moscow, I felt a certain degree of relief, as strange as it sounds. Because by that time, by April 2022, Russia had already introduced draconian war censorship legislation, which made our reporting on Ukraine and Russia's apparent war crimes and abuses in Ukraine subject to criminal liability. So we found ourselves in a position that we really could not even have any staff on the ground because our people could have been easily arrested, prosecuted, and imprisoned for years and years. And facing that challenge, thinking, you know, how exactly am I going to talk to my Russian friends and colleagues and tell them, you are staying, but we have to leave, was painful and awkward and just incredibly complicated. And then the government did it for us. We did not have to shut down preemptively. We got kicked out. Right. So what, what about public opinion? Um, what was the reaction uh, by the public to the closing down of these, organ these civil society human rights organizations? Memorial was shut down, and that was before the full-scale invasion. There was a lot of public support. Mm -hmm. People were attending court hearings. 
mm -hmm. uh, waiting by court buildings in great numbers, huge crowds of people really, too big, uh, <clears throat> the crowds of people which were so huge that of course like very few people could actually get into those courtrooms. Uh, lots of media coverage, lots of uh, outcry, but following on the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, what was happening in Ukraine largely overshadowed everything. And at the same time, Russia was just swiftly descending into raging repression, not just ongoing, repression, but literally raging repression. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, <clears throat> they, when the Moscow Helsinki group was shut down, the level of public attention was already much lower if compared to what was happening around Memorial. And today, uh, as you know, we are closely watching the trial of Oleg Orlov, one of the leading representatives of Memorial, who is facing up to three years in prison solely for condemning Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine and for daring to argue that Russia was, in fact, descending into fascism. The verdict in his case is very likely to be handed down on the 26th of February. And that's what, like it's three days from now. And that's completely horrendous. Speaking mm -hmm. your mind, criticizing the war, criticizing the government, stands for cr criminal liability in Russia today. And according to over the in four and other leading Russian rights groups, way over 200 people are now imprisoned over their actions pertinent to protesting against the war. These are very high numbers. G given, given these numbers and given the case of, of Orlov, um, is it is it even possible for human rights activists to continue work in Russia at the present time? It's a very good question. Like I said, uh, many friends and colleagues remain in Russia and actually continue with their work. Some like Oleg Orlov also vocally and furiously criticize the government and condemn the war in Ukraine. But the price for that criticism, the price for that outspokenness is very high. And this is not only about activists, right? Or about journalists. And as you may know, most independent Russian media had to leave the country following on the full scale invasion, again, because of the war censorship legislation, which made their work impossible. But it's also about your regular people who post something on social media, who come out on single person PCATs and condemn the war. Doesn't matter who they are, doesn't matter which part of the country, doesn't matter their age or social status or gender, those people get detained and some of them get criminally prosecuted. If you compare the level of repression in Russia with the level of repression in neighboring Belarus, yes, the numbers of criminal convictions and draconian imprisonment sentences in Belarus is much, much higher, while the country is actually much smaller. But the Russian government is not going for the big numbers yet. It's rather about selective prosecutions, demonstrative trials, and then draconian sentences, which are all meant to spook 
all others who disagree with the government. Watch it, you know, just watch it. A young woman who changed price tags in a supermarket for names of places in Ukraine under attack and numbers of people killed in Ukraine by Russian forces, prosecuted and sentenced to over seven years in prison just for that. Watch it, it can happen to you too. And now in the aftermath of the death of Alexei Navalny, a, key, a leading Russian opposition politician, so many people who gathered at different sites to lay flowers in his commemoration were actually detained. And some of those people are already being presented with draft notices as a particularly cynical punishment for them daring to bring flowers in memory of a political activist. Mm -hmm. So, so many, many uh, human rights uh, advocates and the media, as you mentioned, have now left Russia. So to, to what extent do they maintain contact with one another, if at all? Do they each tend to go their own way or do they form a distinct community in exile? Well, it's very difficult to speak about a distinct community because people are much dispersed. It's not like several leading independent media outlets and several leading human rights organizations, or rather their teams, all uh, arrive to the same country and settle there and all work from the same country. You've got people in Berlin, you've got people in Paris, you've got people in uh, Latvia, you've got people in Lithuania, you've got people in Southern Caucasus, you've got people in Central Asia. So that's a very dispersed diaspora. But yes, people maintain ties with their friends and colleagues who remain on the ground in Russia. And they also stay in touch closely with one another. So while there is no physical community in one place, there is this well dispersed, but well connected community. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned earlier that the that those working inside Russia and and those outside Russia too <clears throat> are deserving of of support uh, from the global community. I mean, what kinds of support are useful? Uh, and not harmful to those doing this kind of work? Well, first and foremost, it's particularly important to acknowledge that not everyone left, and that there are people these days who take tremendous risks to continue their work inside the country. Because many of my European interlocutors and my policy makers in particular, or my American interlocutors for that matter, basically told me, but wait, like everyone left. It's impossible to do any work there. So everyone left, everyone is in exile. And, well, the answer is no, not everyone is in exile and that has to be acknowledged and creative ways need to be found to support those who are still working inside the country. It's also paramount for those people to be included in the global agenda, to be able to attend international fora, to be directly <clears throat> engaged in international discussions concerning Russia and concerning the future of human rights in the world. And from that perspective, I'm afraid to say that getting people visas to travel to different events in Europe or in Northern America has become very challenging. And they need to travel. They need to travel to 
interact with their colleagues who had to leave the country and already based overseas, to interact with their international partners, to talk to the press, to be able to take part in meetings at the UN, at the Council of Europe, even though Russia is no longer a member, at the European Union, to actually influence the agenda. So this is something very concrete, which can't be done. And then, of course, independent media reports mm -hmm. for Russian-speaking audiences and Russian human rights groups who work to document mm -hmm. and expose abuses and to help those individuals who suffer the abuses, they really need international mm -hmm. support. Speaking of international fora, thinking about the UN and its uh, human rights mechanisms, is are these still accessible and and or helpful to rights advocates both inside and outside Russia? Yes, the UN treaty bodies are still uh, accessible, and uh, they have become particularly important now to victims of rights violations inside Russia, mm -hmm. because with Russia no longer being a member of the Council of Europe, the European Court on Human Rights, which was the most effective protection instrument, is no longer available to the Russians. But that also creates a danger that the UN treaty bodies which are poorly resourced would be overwhelmed by the number of applications <laughs> now have nowhere else to turn and they need to be better resourced mm -hmm. speaking of the un it is also very important to acknowledge that now there is a united nations special rapporteur on the human rights situation in the Russian Federation. And this mandate is quite new. But this situation is so dire that it was, of course, absolutely necessary to create it. And it is now important to make sure that the mandate gets extended and that it gets sufficient resources to be able to do quality work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you've been working with Human Rights Watch now for like 16 years and 14 of those, as you mentioned, are from, you were working for Moscow. So over, over this time, have you altered your approach to monitoring human rights abuses in any way? First and foremost, right now, we have no access to Russia and no access to Belarus, another country in my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that means that instead of doing field work, which is something that I've been doing for years and years and loved more than anything else, we have to resort to interviewing people remotely through secure communication platforms. But also we need to rely very extensively on open source research, on satellite imagery analysis, and other, and we have to rely on tech tools quite heavily to help us in our work. Well, actually, I would say that our Russia-Belarus situation is particularly dramatic because we really do not have access to those countries. But over the years that I've been at Human Rights Watch, the organization has become increasingly tech savvy. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, very important for contemporary human rights research. So we are able to see things happening in places without being physically present. Mm -hmm. Or if we 
are physically present, but we want to make sure that we are not missing anything important. We do rely on tech. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, thank you. And and now finally, I'd I'd like to ask you about the news that's been dominating the headlines all over the world for the past week, and that you referred to earlier, the death of Alexei Navalny. Could could you share your thoughts with us on what exactly happened and why did it happen, and what will be the consequences for Russia? Look, we don't know what exactly happened, but what we know is that whatever happens, the Kremlin is responsible for Mr. Navalny's death. <clears throat> right now, Russian authorities are not even letting the family claim his body, which is absolutely outrageous and makes one thing that they're hiding something and they're hiding something important prior to his death in that very remote penal colony in russia's far north alexei navalny spent about 300 days in punishment cells that is close to one year of the time that he had been in detention altogether in horrific conditions which were undermining his health and were also meant to undermine his morale. He had been thrown into punishment cells 27 times. The government was literally torturing. What his death means for the public in Russia, I mean, look, it's hard for me to speak on behalf of other people, but from whatever I can hear when talking to different individuals, from whatever I can pick up on social media in particular, for many Russians, it's about losing that ray of hope. Because despite his arbitrary arrest, despite his vile politically motivated prosecution, despite all the months and years that he spent in detention, in torturous conditions, he was still reaching out to the public in Russia. He still kept his sense of humor. And in that outrageous situation, he kept pushing Russians not to despair, not to lose hope. Along the lines of, well, you know, look at me, I'm in this situation, I still have it, so you should better keep up. And when he died under those circumstances, many people felt dark despair. And I think that seeing his widow so courageously step into his shoes and pledge that she would continue his work was very encouraging for many. Oh, yes. Mr. Navalny used to say, I have no fear and you should not have any. Now that's basically what his widow mm -hmm. is saying. And that's an important message. As for the Russian government, The Russian government, and I would emphasize that there is a line of division between the Russian people and the Russian government. The Russian government has zero reputation. 
it practically has nothing to lose on that front. And we can all see how mobilization of shame no longer works. Mm -hmm. But someday, they are going to be held accountable. All individuals involved in this, just like all those responsible for horrific abuses and war crimes in Ukraine, are going to be held to account. They are going to pay a price. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Maybe it's not going to happen in the very near future. But sometimes justice takes a long while. Mm -hmm. We should not despair. We should not despair. Absolutely. Well, um, that's a that's a good note uh, to end on. I'm glad that you brought up uh, Navalny's widows. Uh, stepping into this role to help just to help give people hope everywhere it's such a perilous time for both human rights activists and political challengers uh in in many places um i i, I want to thank you uh tanya lakshana uh for meeting with rights in russia today and for sharing your expertise and perspectives we're grateful for your time and wish you the very best in the weeks and months ahead as you continue your work. Thank you, Mary.